Harding described himself as an undersized individual without any outstanding attributes or burning ambition. But I have a mind of my own and a love for the mountains. He did consider himself tough, thoroughly tough. His sister tells of Warren running six miles in the snow, barefoot, to the nearest neighbor for help when their house was burning down. He was only six years old at the time. At the age of 28, he started climbing, old by most standards, but Harding was not to be standardized. He was a dashing figure motoring into Yosemite, usually in a sports car with a beautiful woman and plenty of good wine red wine to thicken the blood, white wine to thin it. He established two new routes on Middle Cathedral Rock, the East Buttress and the North Buttress, considered the first major accomplishment on the Cathedral Rocks. He made the second ascent of the Lost Arrow Chimney and with his small wiry body he was able to work out a new pitch, the Harding Slot. During this climb he arranged for a woman friend to exercise his Jaguar. Each day, he would listen and smile when the car would wind through the gears echoing below. However, it was the audacious idea to climb El Capitan that moved Harding into a new dimension. With its smooth, polished faces and overpowering size, it had not even been considered by others. He achieved his goals his way. He possessed ultimate confidence and answered to no one. And only on his deathbed did he admit that if he could change anything, other than being taller and smarter, he would be a little less nasty. For Warren's Bacchanalian nature could make him dark and ugly. He reveled in tipping waitresses hundred dollar bills after buying all the drinks and the dinner. With glass in hand, he would justify by saying, I don't spend much money on things and besides, someone just had a nice day. He could also give his last water and food to climbing companions so they could push on. Yvonne Chenard experienced this firsthand. Watkins is this big concave looking wall and it gets really hot up there. And, uh, we did it during a heat wave one time and uh, doing the first ascent with Chuck Pratt and uh, in fact, Warren says it's the only climb he's ever done where all three of us were the same size. <laughs> but uh, anyway, we ran out of water, and uh, it, it was a hard climb. And, and you know, when you run out of water, you, you stop urinating. That's the first thing that happens. And then your perspiration smells like urine. And then uh, when you get further along, then you stop perspiring, and then, you know, don't have too much time left before you just basically poison yourself. And we were uh, quite a while without hardly any water and up near the top we had, uh, you know, maybe a, an eighth of a quart and Warren refused to drink any of that water. He gave it, he let Pratt and I finish it uh, knowing that we were a little faster climbers than he was. And, I mean, we were really desperate. Uh, would, would have to change leads maybe three times to finish one pitch and on the on the lead you look down and your Blair would be passed out I mean just slumped right on the ropes completely out uh, it was the closest I've ever been to just really kind of blowing it and Warren refused to take a drink he's really a pretty tough guy and uh, I think you know the the climbs that he picked to do were the type of climbs that he really excelled in, which is real, you know, endurance stuff. And um, you know, he, he he didn't mind placing bolts. And you, you know, the the uh, the rule of climbing is you can do basically anything you want. You know, as long as it doesn't affect somebody else's experience. And I think you know, Warren placed a lot of bolts, but he didn't place very many unnecessary bolts. So uh, a lot of his climbs that he did are still really great climbs. His humor prevailed to the end of his life, encouraging his visiting friends to get on with it, for they don't have much time left. 
He promised he wouldn't buy any more tires with 50,000 mile warranty. When asked what he considered his best bivouac, he replied, you'll have to ask my girlfriends. Beryl Knaut, a fine former girlfriend, tells of their bivouac. We were having a little dinner together and of course drinking the wine as usual. Uh, out of a great big old wine jug and pretty soon both of us started getting more and more tipsy and hysterical and, you know, warm and fuzzy. Next thing you know, we start, we have this... <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so anyway, we ended up, you know, taking all of our clothes off with these bottles of whipped cream and covered each other with whipped cream <laughs> and just being wild and crazy and hysterical in our little, you know, tip cabin. And then we started getting all sticky and covered with, you know, dust and dirt and whatnot, and decided that we needed to take a shower at this point. And we didn't want to get, we couldn't get back into our clothes because we were so yucky and sticky. So instead of, you know, we found a sheet and uh, pulled the sheet over us and danced out into the night, thinking that we were inconspicuous and nobody would be able to see us. <laughs> Heading down to the shower somewhere, and of course, you know, you can't. You know, we had to hold the sheet up high enough so that we could see. So we were totally naked, and flitting through the trees and hiding behind trees. And you know, I don't even remember exactly if we made it to the showers, but I believe that we did. As his catharsis continued, his muscles eased into a soft, smooth cover for old, relaxed bones. A contrast to the harding that stood in slings all night with his arm held over his head, hammering, pounding, drilling, just to reach the summit of El Cap, sleeping on uncomfortable ledges, wet, soaked to the bone, freezing, just to complete a route on a rock wall, a mere line in a guidebook. As he lay there in his last days, he would return to reality to ask what was going on with him why am I here? He had proclaimed often in his life that he had a good ticket, and when the train stopped, he would be ready to get off. When discussing his soul and the possibility of it reattaching to another embryo to continue the cycle of life, he asked, how will you find me? Adding, you will have to start being nicer to little children. To Warren, everyone was equal, a beginning climber or a seasoned climber. After a few drinks with him, you could find yourself climbing a big wall with him. Dave Lomba found himself in just this situation on the Forbidden Wall. And you see, I, I, I mean, I learned how to do aid from Warren, and, uh, but you learn by doing, and I hadn't done anything like this before, so I wasn't a very good aid climber. So um, I start up this thing, and it kind of is a sort of a chimney, but it's narrow, and a, uh, and it's kind of back there, so I'm back in there trying to nail in pins and I get it about 30 feet and it starts to get really much narrower. It starts to overhang a little bit and it's full of mud. It's dripping on me and uh, back there is just this little plates, vertical plates of rock kind of stuck in there. You know? So I'm nailing these things and I look down and I say, Warren, Warren. Warren looks around the corner and says, Dave, I've seen this kind of thing before. <laughs> And in my experience, what you're going to need up there is brute strength and ignorance. <laughs> so I go up about another 10 or 15 feet and it gets much worse and all the little rock plates inside there are totally loose. I can grab them and wiggle them back and forth and I'm nailing pins in there to try to keep the, uh, you know, hold my body weight, forget it. I'm just trying to keep the rocks, you know, to uh, placed in there. And I'm just, I, and then I really start, and, and it's so tight, I can, I'm like, oh, Warren, Warren, oh shit, this is terrible. I'm gonna die up here. What am I gonna do? I'm gonna back out. I'm gonna... Warren sticks his head around the corner. Dave! Yeah, Warren, yeah, well, Dave! More ignorance! <laughs> Some people hated him for reminding them that climbing was an insane, useless sport and should not be taken seriously. In his words, the adrenaline could cause egos and piosity to emerge. Climbing was simply something one could choose to do to be an individualist 
while enjoying the mountains. Ken Yeager was one who had this experience with Warren. The day after I got my driver's license, I went climbing at Lover's Leap and uh, picked Warren up and uh, I was scared to death. Uh, my parents told me never to pick up hitchhikers. And uh, I looked at this guy, he looked kind of scary. And he uh, turned to me and said, uh, I'm Warren Hardy. I go, you're my hero. We stopped and got gas and then uh, we had a great talk and um, I dropped him off at his mother's house, had dinner with him. And uh, about two weeks later we went and uh, went climbing up at uh, Phantom Spires, I believe it was, off of Highway 50. And uh, I was all excited because, all right, I finally got a good climber to go climbing with. He's going to lead me up all these hard routes. And uh, I was very excited. And uh, we went hiking all day. I don't know if you, anybody's ever been up there, but it was before you could drive up there. And uh, we slogged all the way up uh, to the Phantom Spires. And, uh, OK, Warren, what are we going to do? He goes, well, let's make a campfire. I'm like, well, it's dark. I'm thirsty. He goes, well, I got a couple of beers. Um, I just turned 16, if you remember. But um, <laughs> anyway, so we cracked these beers and started fire. He pulls out these hot dogs, a whole bag of uh, buns, a big jar of French's mustard, um, and a wine bottle and two wine glasses. And so we built this campfire. And, and the sun goes down, and uh, we had a great time, and then uh, we stumbled down to the road in the dark afterwards with no headlamp or any of that stuff, but uh, I'll never forget it. It was a memorable experience. Warren was living the American pioneering dream, pushing and pulling up walls into no man's land. Gone forever are those wonderful times when Warren stood staring at the base of a 3,000 foot high wall, just less than a mile wide, looking left and right, up and down, and declaring, climb El Cap? But where? Gone is the sound of tires screaming along the Merced River in the background. Gone is the sound of a car door slamming and Harding's growling voice saying, let's get on with it. Let's get up that big sucker, not knowing what lay ahead. Gone are the sounds of Rachmaninoff wrapping around the pines and sliding across Tenaya Lake. Gone are the days of dome roaming, looking for a perfect place for a high altitude gastronomic orgy. If he were here right now, he would be chastising us saying, what are you doing here? You should be out drinking pints. Thank you, Warren, for your generosity, your humor, and your eye for great lines to follow. We will push on to laugh and play in the sunshine. Uh, excuse me. Have you washed many cars? <laughs>